from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Amorous Ghost by Enid Bagnold. It was five o'clock on a summer morning. The birds who had woken at three had long scattered about their duties. The white plain house blinkered and green shuttered stood four square to its soaking lawns and up and down on the grass, his snow boots planting dark blots on the gray dew walked the owner. His hair was uncombed, he wore his pajamas and an overcoat, and at every turn at the end of the lawn he looked up at a certain window, that of his own in his wife's bedroom, where, as on every other window on the long front, the green shutters lay neatly back against the wall and the cream curtains hung down in heavy folds. The owner of the house, strangely and uncomfortably on his lawns, instead of in his bed, rubbed his chilly hands and continued his tramp. He had a watch on his wrist, but when the stable clock struck six, he entered the house, and passing through the still hall, he went up to his bathroom. The water was lukewarm in the taps from the night before, and he took a bath. As he left the bathroom for his dressing room, he heard the stirring of the first housemaid in the living room below. And at seven o'clock he rang for his butler to lay out his clothes. As the same thing had happened the day before, the butler was half prepared for the bell, yawning and incensed, but ready dressed. Good morning, said Mr. Templeton, rather suddenly. It was a greeting which he never gave, but he wished to try the quality of his voice. Finding it steady, he went on and gave an order for a melon from the greenhouse. For breakfast, he had very little appetite. And when he had finished the melon, he unfolded the newspaper. The door of the dining room opened, and the parlor maid and housemaid came in and gave him their notice. A month from today, sir, repeated the parlor maid to bridge the silence that followed. It's nothing to do with me, he said in a low voice. Your mistress is coming home tonight. You must tell her of these things. They left the room. What's the matter with those girls, said Mr. Templeton to the butler who came in. They haven't spoken to me, sir, said the butler untruly, but I gather there has been an upset. Because I chose to get up early on a summer morning, asked Mr. Templeton with an effort. Yes, sir, and there were other reasons. Which were? The housemaid, said the butler with detachment, as though he were speaking of the movement of a fly. Has found your bedroom, sir, strewn with clothes. With my clothes, said Mr. Templeton. No, sir. Mr. Templeton sat down. A nightgown? He said weakly, as though appealing for human understanding. Yes, sir. More than one? Two, sir. Good God, said Mr. Templeton, and walked to the window, whistling shakily. The butler cleared the table quietly and left the room. There's no question about it, said Mr. Templeton under his breath. She was undressing behind the chair. After breakfast, he walked down in two fields and through a wood with the idea of talking to Mr. George Casson. But George had gone to London for the day Mr. Templeton, faced with the polish on the front door, the polish on the parlor maid, and the sober look of the morning post folded on the hall table, felt that it was just as well that he had not, after all, to confide his incredible story. He walked back again, steadied by the air and exercise. I'll telephone to Hetty, he decided, and make sure that she is coming tonight. He rang up his wife, told her that he was well, that all was well, and her with satisfaction that she was coming down that night after her dinner party, catching the 11.30 arriving at 12.15 at the station. There is no train before at all, she said. I sent round to the station to see, and owing to the strike, they run none between 7.15 and 11.30. Then I'll send the car to the station, and you'll be here at half past twelve. I may be in bed as I'm tired. You're not ill? No, I've had a bad night. 
It was not until the afternoon, after a good luncheon and a whiskey and soda, that Mr. Templeton went up to his bedroom to have a look at it. The cream curtains hung, lightly blowing in the wind. By the fireplace stood a high-wing grandfather chair, upholstered in pattern rep. Opposite the chair in the fireplace was the double bed, in one side of which Mr. Templeton had lain working at his papers the night before. He walked up to his chair, put his hands in his pockets, and stood looking down on it. Then he crossed to the chest of drawers and drew out a drawer. On the right-hand side were Hattie's vest and chemises, neatly pressed and folded. On the left was a pile, folded but not pressed, of Hattie's nightgowns. Mr. Templeton noted the crumples and creases on the silk. Evidence, evidence, he said, walking to the window, that something happened in this room after I left it this morning. The maids believe they found a strange woman's nightgowns crumpled on the floor. As a matter of fact, they are Hetty's nightgowns. I suppose a doctor would say I'd done it myself in a trance. Two nights ago, he thought, looking again at the bed. It seemed a week. The night before last, as he lay working, propped up on pillows and cushions and his papers spread over the bed, he had glanced up, absorbed, at two o'clock in the morning, and traced the pattern on the grandfather chair as it stood facing the empty gate with its back towards him, just as he had left it when he had gotten to bed. It was then that he had seen the two hands hanging idly over the back of the chair as though an unseen owner was kneeling in the seat. His eyes stared, and a cold fear wandered down his spine. He sat without moving and watched the hands. Ten minutes passed, and the hands were withdrawn quickly as though the occupant of the chair had silently changed its position. Still he watched, propped, stiffening on his pillows, and as time went on, he fought the impression down. I'm tired, he said. Once read of it, the brain reflecting something, his heart quietened, and cautiously he settled himself a little lower and tried to sleep. He did not dare straighten the litter of papers around him, but with the light on, he lay there till the dawn lit the yellow paint on the wall. At five he got up, sleepless as his eyes on the back of the grandfather chair, and without his dressing gown or slippers he left the room. In the hall he found an overcoat and his warm snow boots behind a chest, and unbolting the front door he tramped the lawn in the dew. On the second night, last night, he had worked as before, so completely had he convinced himself after a day of fresh air that his previous night's nice experience had been the result of his own imagination, his eyesight, and his mind hallucinated by his work, that he had not even remembered, as he had meant to do, to turn the grandfather chair with its seat towards him. Now, as he worked in bed, he glanced from time to time at its patterned and concealing back, and wished vaguely that he had thought to turn it around. He had not worked more than two hours before he knew that there was something going on in the chair. Who's there, he called. The slight movement he had heard ceased for a moment and began again. For a second he thought he saw a hand shoot out at the side, and once he could have sworn he saw the tip of a mound of hair showing over the top. There was a sound of scuffling in the chair, and some objects flew out and landed with a bump on the floor below the field of his vision. Five minutes went by, and after a fresh scuffle, a hand shot up and laid a bundle, white and stiff, with what seemed a small arm hanging on the back of the chair. Mr. Templeton had had two bad nights and a great many hours of emotion. When he grasped that the object was a pair of stays with the suspender swinging from them, something bumped unevenly in his heart. A million black motes like a cloud of flies swam in his eyeballs. He fainted. He woke up and the room was dark, the light off, and he felt a little sick. Turning in bed to find comfort for his body, he remembered that he had been in the middle of a crisis of fear. He looked about him in the dark and saw again the dawn on the curtains. Then he heard a chink by the washstand, several feet nearer to his bed than the grandfather chair. He was not alone. The thing was still in the room. By the faint light from the curtains, he could just see that his visitor was by the washstand. There was a gentle clinking of china and a sound of water, and dimly he could see a woman standing. 
Undressing, he said to himself, washing. His gorge rose at the thought that came to him. Was it possible that the woman was coming to bed? It was that thought that had driven him with a wild rush from the room and sent him marching for a second time up and down his gray and dewy lawns. And now, thought Mr. Templeton, as he stood in the neat bedroom in the afternoon light and looked around him, had he's got to believe in the unfaithful or the supernatural. He crossed to the grandfather chair and taking it in his two hands was about to push it on the landing, but he paused. I'll leave it where it is tonight, he thought, and go to bed as usual. For both our sakes, I must find out something more about all this. Spending the rest of the afternoon out of doors, he played golf after tea and eating a very light dinner, he went to bed. His head ached badly from lack of sleep, but he was pleased to notice that his heart beat steadily. He took a couple of aspirin tablets to ease his head, and with a light novel settled himself down in bed to read and watch. Hetty would arrive at half past twelve, and the butler was waiting up to let her in. Sandwiches, nicely covered from the air, were placed ready for her on a tray in a corner of the bedroom. It was now eleven. He had an hour and a half to wait. She may come at any time, he said, thinking of his visitor. He had turned a grandfather chair towards him so that he could see the seat. A quarter of an hour went by, and his head throbbed so violently that he put the book on his knees and altered the lights, turned out the brilliant reading lamp, switched on the light which illuminated the larger face of the clock over the mantelpiece so that he sat in shadow. Five minutes later, he was asleep. He lay with his face buried in the pillow, the pain still drumming in his head, aware of his headache even at the bottom of sleep. Dimly, he heard his wife arrive and murmured a hope to himself that she would not wake him. A slight movement rustled around him as she entered the bedroom and undressed, but his pain was so bad that he could not bring himself to give a sign of life, and soon, while he clung to his half-sleep, he felt the bedclothes gently lifted and heard her slip in beside him. Feeling chilly, he drew his blanket closer around him. It was as though a drop was blowing about him in the bed, dispelling the mist of sleep and bringing him to himself. He felt a touch of remorse at his lack of welcome, and putting out his hand, he sought his wife's beneath the sheet. Finding her wrist, his fingers closed around it. She too was cold, strange, icy, and from her stillness and silence she appeared to be asleep. A cold drives from the station, he thought, and held her wrist to warm it as he dozed again. She is positively chilling the bed, he murmured to himself. He was awakened by a roar beneath the window and the sweep of a light across the wall of the room. With amazement, he heard the bolts shoot back across the front door. On the illuminated face of the clock over the fireplace, he saw the hand standing at twenty-seven minutes past twelve. Then Mr. Templeton, still gripping the wrist beside him, heard his wife's clear voice in the hall below. The Face in the Mirror by Dennis Val Baker I saw him watching me in the wide mirror of the barber saloon. He was a wiry little man of about forty, with a round, bullet-like head, going bald. He was drably dressed in baggy flannels and a faded brown jacket, with a Macintosh over one arm and slouching trilby hat balanced on his knees. He seemed a subdued and insignificant figure, yet there was something disturbingly familiar about him, his face which was rather ugly with protruding front teeth and deep, unsightly eye sockets was not a stranger's face. Something about it provoked in me an odd feeling of impending surprise, of startled recognition to come. I felt I ought to have known his face immediately but somehow remained shadowy and indefinable, slightly and worryingly, outside the focus of my understanding. It was about four o'clock, and I had dropped in for a shave on my way home from work. I was leaning back with my eyes half closed, pretending to be immersed in an animated conversation with the barber, and I don't think the little man realized I had observed his interest. I remembered that he had come into the barber shop just behind me. I had taken the proffered shaving chair, while he had taken off his hat and Macintosh and sat down on the bench for waiting customers. As far as I knew, he had picked up one of the newspapers on the bench and started reading it. It was only by chance, while the barber was filling the hot water mug from a can in the corner, 
that I happened to look in the mirror and see the little man staring across the room with bright burning eyes. With sudden uneasiness, I realized his gaze was aimed specifically in my direction. It was not a casual, not a mildly curious gaze, but rather the fierce, almost wolfish gaze of a man who had suddenly set eyes on a prey for which he had long been seeking. The eyes seemed to burn into the mirror with a sort of consuming hatred. I felt a chill creep into my reclining body. Of course, I was being quite ridiculous, I told myself, fighting hard against a tremendous desire to turn my head away and pretend it was all a dream. I was imagining things. In a moment or so, I would see the man's eyes drift away and return and board unconcerned to their newspaper. But unfortunately, they did not. They remained instead fixed unwaveringly upon me, two pinpoints of steely menace that bored into my very existence. They seemed to be alight with an evil flame, and they were growing brighter and brighter. I stuck it for a while, wiggling uncomfortably in my seat and trying unsuccessfully to let the monotone of the barber's voice lull me into a sense of security. Then I felt the little man's gaze become fiercer, more impelling, and I began to get really perturbed. For God's sake, hurry up and finish, I muttered to the barber out of the corner of my mouth, so that the little man wouldn't notice. I drummed my fingers nervously on the side of the chair while the barber, disgruntled, gave me a hasty swipe of a towel over my face, then roughly whisked off the cover sheet. As I rose from the chair, I looked casually into the mirror. The eyes of the little man rose upwards with me, following my movements steadily. I couldn't be quite sure his face was still blurred, but it seemed that a quick look of cunning flitted across his face, as if he were making some rapid decision to cope with the new problem created by my imminent departure. For a moment I hesitated, wondering if he would rise and dutifully take the seat which the barber was now politely offering to him. Indeed, he was beginning to rise, but some flash of intuition warned me that he had no intentions of taking the seat. I hastily thrust a coin into the barber's hand. Keep the change, I said hurriedly. Then I grabbed up my Macintosh and hat and ran out of the shop, swinging the door back behind me viciously. I didn't dare to look back, but I felt sure that the little man had come after me. I began walking down the street as fast as I could without actually running, intent on finding some sort of hiding place. When I came to a Woolworths on the corner, I darted through the entrance. Inside there was a thick crowd of shoppers. I threaded my way among them, burying deeper and deeper into the mass of sticky humanity. When I reached the stationary counter at the far end of the shop, I felt safer. Looking back, I could see a jumble of housewives, old men and children, but no sign of the little man. I breathed easier and began walking slowly up and down the counter. I felt a tempting sensation of relief stealing over me. It would be all right now. Probably the little man's view had been temporarily blocked at the particular moment I stepped into Woolworth's. He would have gone hurrying by. I would give him a few minutes, then come out of the shop and get a bus home. I began wandering from counter to counter, looking at the goods with idle curiosity. I passed from stationery to kitchenware, then to hardware, then back to stationery. Passing the hardware counter for the third time, I felt the assistant eyeing me and hastily picked up a colored mixing bowl. I'll take this, I said, smiling brightly at her. She took my silver and moved away to get changed. I found myself smiling into a long, rather dirty mirror which lined the wall behind the counter. I went on smiling rather mechanically, then felt the grin slowly freeze across my face. Standing at the counter behind me, I could see the little man. His slouch hat pulled down over his eyes, his Macintosh thrown untidily over his shoulder. He was pretending to examine a writing pad, but all the time his eyes were darting round the shop. Feeling like a hypnotized rabbit, I stood there without moving and watched his gaze travel round until it alighted abruptly on me. For a moment we remained like two statues. Then the little man started to move. I had an extraordinary feeling that he was going to vault over the counter towards me. Crying out in sudden terror, I dropped the bowl on the edge of the counter, cracking it into a dozen pieces, and started running down the corridor, leading to the nearest exit. 
Behind me I heard a startled cry of the assistant. Shoppers and other assistants turned a sea of surprised faces in my direction, but before they could make any move to stop me, I had plunged through an exit swing door. As I did so, I fancied I caught a glimpse of the little man irritably pushing his way through a converging crowd of people. Outside in the street again, I felt bare and defenseless, like an animal caught in the open. Seeing another big store on the other side of the road, I made a dash for it, skipping neatly across the path of a tram and passing smoothly through a revolving door. As I went in, I looked across the road and saw the Woolworth's door bursting open, and I knew that he was after me. This was one of the higher class doors. Mostly clothing and drapery, the tall counters and drooping fabrics offered some excellent cover. I hurriedly skirted round the shop, keeping an occasional eye on the entrance to see if the little man would come in. Unfortunately, while doing that, I backed into a precarious tower of carpet rolls and brought the whole lot tumbling down, spread eagling me to the floor. Terrified by a sudden fear that the little man would come leaping down on me, I scrambled to my feet and started running away without even waiting to repair the damage, taking with me a blurred vision of a shop walker's stout, reddening face, convulsed with indignation. I went on, turning two or three corners, passing through the ladies' underwear and brassiere sections. Then I began to wonder whether, during my accident, the little man had entered the shop and was even now waiting for me behind some tall display stand. It would certainly be safer to transfer myself to some other floor. Looking around, I saw a convenient sign pointed lifts. I hurried along, and in luck's way, I found the lift way the uniformed girl about to close the gates. Hey, wait! I cried, running up. The girl smiled demurely and stepped aside. I went in and flopped onto a welcome bench. The girl called out, Co Going up? Some other passengers crowded in after me. Then she clanged the gate, and the lift started rising. Something made me take an easy stock of my surroundings. My nearest neighbors were two faded old ladies off for an afternoon's shopping. Next to them were a mother and her small little girl. Beyond her, beyond her, I caught a glimpse of the side of a man's face. There was something about it. One of the old ladies turned, sweeping her wide-brimmed hat out of my line of vision. Then, indeed, I nearly died. The little man was standing exactly opposite with only one or two women between us. At the sight of me, a ferocious grin split his face into an evil mask. His drawn-back lips seemed about to mouth fearful epithet. For the first time, I realized how incomparably sinister a figure he was, how threatening was the whole of his hard, shriveled-up, menacing presence. Now, indeed, there was no longer any room for doubt, no chance of pretending otherwise than that it was a chase for life or death. My tongue parched in my mouth. I tried to utter words. Help, I said. Help! I thought I was crying out, but the words must have stuck in my throat. What floor did you say? said the lift girl looking at me. I didn't reply. I just stared fascinatedly at the little man, and he stared back at me. I noticed he had a small unkempt mustache and a stubble of beard and a sharp pointed nose. I suddenly thought of a miniature Mistopheles. At any moment, he would brush aside the old ladies with a wave of his hand. Third floor, said the lift girl unemotionally. Here, let me get out, I cried wildly. With a terrific surge of strength, I seized one of the old ladies around her waist and half lifted, half threw her into the path of the little man. Then I dived out of the lift, knocking the surprised lift girl against the side. Seeing some stairs running beside the lift shaft, I darted to them and began bounding down them two at a time. I heard someone call out after me. He must be mad. Stop him. It was probably the old lady, or more likely the little fellow. He would be after me down the stairs like a terrier. I beat him to the exit, however. I flew out of that store even faster than I had left Woolworth's. This time I gave up all pretense and began running, hell for leather, down the street. I saw people staring at me, and a policeman raised his eyebrows, but I didn't care how much attention I aroused. I only wanted to get a long way away. I ran the whole length of the main shopping street and then took a turning at random into a smaller secondary street. I was puffing. It was some years since I had done any running. The trouble was my lunch was still a weight on me. It had been a good and heavy one.
and I bitterly regretted my two mild and bitters. I could hear them swishing about inside me. Looking back, I couldn't see any sound of the little man. So I slackened my run to a panting walk. I wasn't full enough to think I had given him the slip, but at least I had time to think and maneuver, although I could hear my heart beating with heavy thuds. I felt much cooler in the head. I remembered reading in detective stories that danger sharpened the brain. Well, something like that was happening to me. It was high time I forgot all about how three quarters of an hour ago I had been walking home from work like I had done for 19 years and how I thought it might be a good idea to sh have a shave. I liked now and then to have the thing done professionally. It was high time I forgot all about that and concentrated on the job in hand. Here I was walking down a dusty side street which I didn't rightly recognize going the opposite direction to my home in the suburbs and not far behind, a little man with a bullet head was after me, peeping in and out of the shop fronts. I gave him credit for that. He looked a thorough sort. I would have to fox him and fox him properly. It couldn't be done lightly. It had to be thought out carefully. I seemed to be moving into the business quarters. I passed big blocks of offices inhabited by hundreds of formal unknown messiahs. I wondered whether to slip into one of the buildings and hide for a while but decided the risk of arousing suspicion, possibly of being captured by a truculent commissionaire, was too great. I went on, walking about twice as fast as would ordinarily be the case. It was tiring, but it helped to keep up my morale. I kept crossing from one side of the road to another and taking right turnings and then left turnings. In this way, I reckoned to mix the little man up a good deal. Also, in the process, I got myself completely lost. Indeed, I was gradually overcome by a fantastic feeling that I was now in a completely strange town without any knowledge of locality or direction. It was possible that, in fact, many of the streets were normally familiar to me. But as I turned down the street, up one and down the other, I began to feel that I was in some gigantic maze whose towering walls were nebulous and unreal. Twice I became so lost that I found myself back at a street corner which I had passed a few moments previously. On the third occasion that this happened, I found myself walking back on my tracks and saw, some way ahead of me, a disturbance at a street crossing. I didn't know how he had done it, but I guessed that the little fellow was on my trail again. Pushing his way through a crowd, I turned round and began running again. It was exciting in a way. It was always a persistent thrill of danger arising out of the knowledge that I was being chased. There was, too, always the possibility of my coming round the corner and walking straight into the little man. I wondered which of us would have the presence of mind to act first. I rather prided myself that we could at least be about even. I had worked out a very neat plan for lowering my head, butting him hard in the stomach and then dashing away. When coming round the corner, I bumped straight into a tall, heavy policeman, knocking him sideways and staggering backwards myself. I'm terribly sorry, officer, I said. Then I didn't wait for any more because I recognized his face. I knew that I had already walked past him four times in four different streets. I had a dim idea that he shouted something after me, but by that time I disappeared down the alleyway. It was a very long alley and towering buildings shut out most of the light. I walked along it feeling more and more alone and frightened. When I eventually emerged from it into a rather dingy shopping street, I was so exhausted. After three imaginary encounters in the shadows with a little man and one terrifying episode in which I saw a policeman starting towards me out of a lamp post, that there was sweat dripping off my forehead and a weak feeling in my legs. That's the trouble with being chased. It doesn't matter really who's chasing you. If it goes on long enough, it gets to the stage where you feel like everyone's chasing you. For instance, it wasn't long before I was going round not only with the little man and the big policeman on my track, but also with the knowledge that if I passed their way again at least three other people, a vegetable stall man, a newspaper seller and a squat woman shopkeeper, would decide I was either a criminal or a madman and start chasing me themselves. For that reason, I made a concentrated effort to move steadily away from the district where I had been wandering for an hour or so. When I came out onto the shopping street, one of the suburban type 
I knew that I was succeeding to some extent. The street was less crowded. There was more space between the buildings and their trams had that emptying look as if they were penetrating further and further out of the town. All this time it was true I hadn't seen the little man, but I knew that he was after me. There was something so very sure about him that I felt he wouldn't be thrown off easily. Indeed, I remembered once seeing a film about something like that, where a fellow was chased all over the place by a gunman. No matter what this man did, the gunman kept tracking him down. In the end, he cornered him in his own sitting room with his wife in a faint on the floor and shot him three times through the head. It turned out, of course, that the fellow being chased had played a dirty trick on the gunman in the past, so it was all made to seem quite reasonable. My trouble was that I felt quite sure that the little man would keep finding me, but I couldn't for the life of me think of any reason for his interest. It was possible he hadn't got a gun. I shivered. His eyes were bad enough, but it was possible he had. I was glad that I hadn't gone home. Following my first impulse, at least I wouldn't drag my wife into it. I hadn't forgotten my wife. I knew that already she would be somewhat worried. Most evenings I got home by five o'clock, and we always had supper at six. Now it was well after six and getting to be dusk. Several times I thought, well, I'll phone her anyway, and crossed over to a telephone box. But each time I went inside and heard the door bang on me, a terrifying feeling came over me. There I was, all nicely cooped up in an oblong box. The next moment I could see the little man glaring in through the glass panes. The moment I had thought that I pushed back the door and dashed out of the box. What's more, I was always pretty sure that if I hadn't done so, he would have been round the corner and on top of me. I felt happier on the move. The trouble was that I had suddenly become conscious of my physical body. It was tired, dead tired. Not for ten years had I walked and run so much. My head urged me to wander on until I had shaken off the little man. My legs and the rest of my body just ached and ached. Aching like that can wear down anything, even the most rigid of purposes. It just goes on and on, gets heavier and wearier, until you feel you'll drop down dead about three steps forward. I didn't see much point in that. I began looking around for some shelter. Besides, it was getting dark and there might be some real chance of giving him the slip. I picked in the end on a small cinema, tucked away among a block of shops. It suddenly struck me as a brilliant idea. I fished two bob out of my pocket and darted in, thrusting the money at the box office girl, grabbing the ticket and plunging into the welcome darkness. It was all smoky and hazy inside, but it was shelter. I found a seat at the end of the row. It was soft and cushioned. I sank into it with a sensuous feeling of comfort. I stretched my legs out luxuriously, leaned with heavy pleasure on the armrest. I turned my attention to the screen and tried to forget about the little man. It was about two minutes from the end of the big picture. Something about a matador in Spain, the scene of bullfight finale, when I heard the little man coming into the cinema. There's no way of explaining how or why. I just knew it was him. There was a faint light from the door. Then I saw a shadow, a small shadow, floating down the aisle. There wasn't any girl or anyone else, just him. He was pretending to be a stranger, looking around casually for a seat. But I was watching him like a hawk, and I saw him stop at the end of my row and slide himself into the first seat. A moment later, he was sitting in the fifth seat. Then he dropped into the seventh seat. There were four seats between him and me, and the bull in the film was just making its death charge, when I leaped out of my seat and fled toward the cinema exit. It was a familiar feeling, only this time I did it quicker than ever before. I fancy even the little man was surprised. It was dark when I got outside. It gave me a feeling of security just like the cinema. I began loitering past the shops, trying to catch the sound of the little man's footsteps. The next thing that happened was someone shone a torch full on me, dazzling me, bathing me in relentless light. There wasn't time for any thinking. I just lowered my head and made a wild rush at the light. I think my head went about straight into the center of a stomach. The light went out and I heard a strangled ouch of pain. I must admit it gave me a thrill of sadistic pleasure that moment. The action was so completely and devastatingly successful. 
It put me temporarily in supreme control of the situation. I felt a shadow sprawling on the pavement and started running away into the darkness. The wind was on my face as I vanished into the darkness. Indeed, it was almost exhilarating. I guess that had made him mad. I heard some shouting and saw the torch come on again, whirling savagely. I also heard the surprising sound of a shrill whistle. A few minutes later, there was an answering whistle somewhere ahead of me. These things, happening one after the other, got me rather confused, but I had enough presence of mind to take a turning and sprint down its deep into the night. I had to stop running pretty soon. I had to lean against the lamppost and take great heaving breaths. Otherwise, I felt I should have collapsed. I stood there for several tense moments, getting my breath back, and at that same time listening for the sound of chasing footsteps. But by some miracle, the quiet remained unbroken. My ears had to be content with the dull rustle of wind in the treetops that lined the road and with far-off occasional hoots of cars. It was very eerie, very eerie indeed, for I suddenly realized, because there were no footsteps, it did not mean I was not being followed. I would be a fool not to concede more than average intelligence to the little man. He was the sort, I decided, visualizing a small, crafty face, alive with hidden cunning, who would possibly wrap clothes over his boots, or even take them off. In a flash, all sense of temporary relief vanished. Standing there became aware with a blinding horror that every shadow, however vague, every rustle, however muffled, might not be what it seemed. Even the solid shapes of the trees might not be real. I think it was when I got to that state of mind that I gave up all efforts to preserve my morality, my sense of ethics, my character of an ordinary citizen who some hours previously had been sitting in his respectable office doing his respectable job, there swimming in the menacing shadows of a suburban residential street, I gave it all up and became the hunted fugitive, the animal who must use his cunning, not only to outwit his chaser, but to dispose of him. I can remember how clear and simple it all became. It was as if a tremendous load had fallen away. I felt a wave of confidence pouring into me. At the same time, I felt myself in powerful control of all my senses, became aware of newly acquired strength. I waited not in fear, but in expectancy for what I knew would eventually come. I didn't mind how long the wait now that I knew exactly what course of action to follow, exactly what events were going to take place. And it was a long wait. I felt the cold night air creeping into my clothes, enveloping my feet, my fingers, my ears, sinking into my limbs. I didn't dare stamp or flap my arms for fear of giving my position away. For now, the whole essence of success was surprise. I had moved close into the shadow of a tree, merging myself into its frame. I could not possibly be seen against that dark outline. There I waited, breathing as quietly as possible, hardly daring to move a muscle. In fact, I felt it would be dangerous even to think. I might weaken in my new resolve, so I deliberately devoted my mind to counting numbers. I had reached 145, I think, when I heard him coming. Probably to anyone else, it would have sounded just like a rustle of wind in the trees or a leaf blowing about. But of course, that was just what he would have wanted me to think. I envisaged now his triumphant smile, his sense of achievement, and smiled to myself. There was hardly any sound, just that faint, occasional, apparently casual rustle. I can't imitate the sound in writing, but it was rather like somebody turning over the pages of a newspaper. And that, of course, reminded me of how I had first seen him sitting there in the barber shop, so insignificant, so innocent. A huge burning indignation swept over me, at the thought of all the trouble he had given me. What had I ever done to him? Who was he to hound me down like a criminal? What right had he to bring terror into my life? It would take me weeks to recover from that one evening. And my wife? God knows what she would be thinking. I had just reached the apex of these thoughts when I saw him. He was only a few feet away from me, the vaguest of shadows. But a sixth sense told me that it was him, he was sliding along like some dirty little sneak thief. I counted as he came nearer, giving him a certain number of steps to come level. One, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, I said out loud, or I might even have shouted it to startle him. Then I leapt forward and clutched him, and we went rolling onto the ground. I had taken him completely by surprise. I was able to get my hands around his neck just where I wanted to. I knew exactly what to do. I had read it all in considerable detail in a crime novel. I held my fingers firmly into the flesh of his neck, pressing my body down hard on him, and with my two thumbs, I felt for the narrow stem of his windpipe. I had got him. I knew I had got him. I could feel him suddenly struggling convulsively like a drowning man. I maintained my grip, pressing tighter and tighter. I could feel my nails cutting into the flesh of his neck. I could hear the breath ebbing out of him. My stranglehold sank deeper and deeper. Then suddenly, like an immense nightmare, the darkness seemed to swoop down on me, pouring over me in a gigantic wave of pain, conscious of a helpless, detached sensation of bewilderment. I felt myself falling away, falling, 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 down into a deep black oblivion. When I opened my eyes again, it was no longer dark, but bright daylight. I was no longer fighting for my life in a quiet back street, but lying in bed in a hospital ward, with sunshine pouring through a window and falling in great streaks across the white coverlet. There was a white-coated nurse sitting at a table in one corner. When she saw me open my eyes, she got up and came over. She was smiling. Somehow it warmed me through and through to see her smile. I felt I just wanted to lie back there and drowse away with everything big and white and peaceful, with the sunshine pouring in and the nurse smiling. But there was something stopping me. Something small and hard-pressing, far away at the back of my mind. I didn't quite know what it was, and I couldn't quite express myself. I looked up beseechingly at the nurse. She smiled and bent down, putting a cool hand on my head. It's all right. You just relax, she said. You've had a nasty experience, a terrible shot. But you're going to be all right now. You just lie back and go to sleep again. But I couldn't go back to sleep. I couldn't. She must have known that, I thought irritably. I tried to tell her what I wanted with my eyes. I looked at her pleadingly, passionately, begging her to answer my unformed question. For a few moments she stood looking down at me, a puzzled line creasing her forehead. Then she seemed to understand. She gave a wide, reassuring smile. Now, don't you worry. You've had a nasty shot. Some madman tried to strangle you. Your neck's been cut about a bit, but there's nothing permanently damaged. A week or two here, and we'll be able to pack you off home. I looked at her dumbly. I felt as if I were about to tumble over the edge of a terrifying precipice, which I had climbed painfully and laboriously. I motioned her nearer, struggling to speak. The words came out at last, each one hurting the dry, swollen lining of my throat. Please, I said. Please, bring me a mirror. The nurse hesitated and nodded. She went over to the corner of the room and came back holding a large oval hand mirror. There you are, she says soothingly. Only some bandages around your neck. Nothing very frightening, is it? But I didn't answer her. I looked in the mirror, and the face I saw was a familiar one. It was small and ugly, with protruding teeth and sunken eyes, and the head was bald and round, like a bullet.' 